Here's what's coming up on your horizon. Well, when you look at the numbers, our nation's economic recovery looks strong. We've had 11 straight quarters of GDP growth and 50 straight months of private sector job growth. Unemployment's down and consumer confidence and spending are both up. Yet there are significant problems underneath those statistics. Wages have stagnated since the Great Recession and millions of Americans are having trouble finding good paying jobs. Today, we're going to focus on Oklahoma's workforce from the trend of having a second, third, or even fourth career. You always get a background story of an adult, um, and it's very unique and interesting to hear their stories about how they come back to education and uh, how they want to retrain themselves. To the demands of an industry needing a workforce and needing it now. This is something we're trying to do to help the student and to help the companies. We want to meet both ends of that. I'll sit down with the author of The Coming Jobs War to hear why he believes America's workforce is on the cusp of some radical changes. To imagine that the country's on the right track right now is not right. And we end our day with an Oklahoman who makes no bones about it. His job isn't for everyone, but for him, it's both interesting and lucrative. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Rob McClendon. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. Well, Labor Department statistics show that young people entering the workforce this year will on average have between 15 and 20 different jobs over the course of their working lives. And oftentimes, these jobs are in completely different career fields, sometimes by choice and sometimes by circumstance. Our Lisa Hines introduces us to an Oklahoman who says the winds of change are blowing workers like him down a new career path. Today, Philip Germain is working on a computer, but it's not what he's been doing for the last 30 years. I worked as a shipyard worker, sheet metal mechanic and welder for around six years, and the rest of my life I worked in factories, manufacturing, boat motor plants, assembly, things of that nature. During the recession, I was laid off from my job, and I wasn't finding a whole lot in the area. Matter of fact, it frustrated me because I actually watched plants shut down instead of hiring more people. A fate many workers may face someday, but for Philip, rather than worry about the job that disappeared, he's focusing his efforts on gaining the skills that can help him find a new job in a new field. And he likes the change of pace. The IT field and going to school here I think is very different. It's a lot more of a quiet and laid back environment. I like the idea of working at my own pace. I learn a lot from it that way because instead of placing a student in a box, everybody's at a different level. And I, I learn a lot by working at my own level. It, it seems to help me quite a bit. And coming to Meridian Tech just made sense to Philip. Well, with my age, I already have, currently have student loans from going to school at NOC and OSU and Meridian was a good option for me because I can finish school in a year and a half to two years and it was pennies on a dollar compared to what I could go back to college for. Meridian's Rebecca Eastham says having an articulation agreement in place with the university is really the way to go. Students can come to a technology center, gain a fabulous skill, a trade, those technical skills, industry certification, and begin to be competitively employed right away. But at the same time, it can launch their college career as well. So it's not, uh, you know, I have to do one or the other. I can choose to do both. By the time I graduate, I'll have my network engineering degree. And according to Phillips instructor, Daniel Devers, going back to school is half the battle. We have a unique opportunity in, in a career tech system that we not only get to teach high school students, but adult students as well. And it always differs between, you always get a background story of an adult, um, and it's very unique and interesting to hear their stories about how they come back to education and uh, how they want to retrain themselves um, to get a better job or to get a better position in, in society. 
I find it very, very challenging to go back to school as an adult. Things have changed quite a bit and I just have to study a little bit harder and try a little bit uh, harder on some of the curriculum and things, but uh, I make it through. Focusing on the future. I think I want to graduate and I plan on working for a large corporation, possibly a large hospital. Uh, I can start out small in the IT field, maybe work my way up. I would like to eventually get my Network Plus uh, CompTIA certification. I think that'll be very helpful. And this class prepares me for that and gets me ready so I can pass that exam and have it uh, on my resume. Retraining by learning new skills and filling the skills gap to a future that's on the rise. Now when we return, we look at the flip side of people changing careers from time to time and see how industry is looking for rapid workforce development. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon, featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. Well, in our increasingly globalized and highly competitive economy, businesses are hardly ever stable. Companies constantly growing and shrinking, and that can pose a workforce challenge. Joining me now with more on how the state is reacting to those challenges is our Andy Barth. Well, Rob, it's called Rapid Workforce Development a program run by Oklahoma Career Tech that helps industry to develop a skilled workforce in a matter of weeks. We met up with some workers at Tulsa Tech to see how the program is helping both employers and employees. At first glance, it's a typical shop class. But these students are burning their way into a yearning workforce. What we're seeing is more of a need for a pipeline of workers. Jeff Lowe is the industrial coordinator at Tulsa Tech and says companies need workers trained quickly and correctly. Companies generally, when they start to expand or they need to hire new people, they want to get somebody up to speed as quickly as possible. And the best way to do that is through competency-based. And we're seeing more and more of a need for that and a lack of a skilled workforce uh, quickly to meet those needs. And for employer Larry Bradshaw, this program is designed perfectly to fit his needs. It's a very good situation for us to where it's open entry, open exit. I'm not bound to uh, starting in uh, August and ending in May. Uh, I can get these guys in when I, if I hire a guy in in January. I can have him starting in February. So I was very interested in the way the setup of this program was. It was very conducive to my hiring and training of my people. Good news for companies and employees. Bradshaw says this training helps fill the welding demand with the right skilled workers. The need for welders is very high right now. Um, and you see that in just employment ads. I mean, even just billboards on the road. There's a huge demand for welders. It's a very good career, very good salary, a uh, good chance for advancement, good benefits. And for student Henry Roder, learning to weld makes his job easier. Well, I've been a uh, service and test supervisor for about 25 years, and I'm moving into more of a quality inspecting welds. I got the opportunity to come in and actually learn to weld, so I know what I'm talking about. Making Rotor more independent and more marketable. I've learned a lot. It's, I used to have to chase down welders to do it. <laughs> now I can do it myself a little bit. An achievement, Lowe says, is only possible with the right instruction. You have to have an instructor that can multitask with a lot of different students at a lot of different levels, and that is really key to the program. Which is where welding instructor Jack Mars comes in. Well, I think it's an excellent program for any employer that has employees that they already work there and they know what their work ethics are so there's no reason to not want them to train employees they already have to move up into a welding position. Creating a gateway to the workforce, one spark at a time. This is something we're trying to do to help the student and to help the companies. We want to meet both ends of that and make a person employable as soon as we can and meet the needs of the company to be able to expand their workforce. 
Now, after this training, workers will have the skills needed for career advancement. According to Lowe, welding workers can start out at $13 to $14 an hour. After the certification and experience, they can earn up to $35 an hour with the opportunity for overtime. Certainly not a bad little paycheck. Now, I also understand that welding will soon not be the only program that they offer like this. That's right, Rob. Because of the success of the welding program, they've started another program that deals with CNC operation that's already underway. And as far as the future of the program goes, they are working on a overhead crane safety and operation program as well as another welding program that will all start this fall. All right, thank you so much, Andy. You're welcome, Rob. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, a bare bones career. But first, the coming jobs war. When it comes to what people think, few individuals have more insights than our next guest. Jim Clifton is the chairman and CEO of Gallup Incorporated, known best for its in-depth Gallup polls. And what Clifton has learned over the years, he has put into a new book called The Coming Jobs War. I was able to sit down with Mr. Clifton after he presented a global briefing at Oklahoma State University. Well, Mr. Clifton, the 20th century has often been called the American century. We're now in the second day or decade of the 21st century. Simple question, how are we doing? I think we're going to be okay. I don't think we're doing real well right now. Uh, I think unemployment does not actually portray the, what really exists in the job market. It says, we're, I, I think they say unemployment's at six or seven. The number of people as a percent of the population that actually have a good job is the lowest it's been in over 30 years. That's measured by the Department of Labor. And 40 million Americans woke up this morning with no job at all or being grossly underemployed. As a percent, that's the highest that's ever been, too. The truth of unemployment is not what you read in either the Wall Street Journal or you hear from Washington. They're both special interest groups, but God bless them both. You and I would probably do the same thing. But I'd rather be holding our cards, United States cards, for sure, than China's or Germany's or anybody else's. But to imagine that the country's on the right track right now is not right. Mm -hmm. So staying here domestic, we have seen our GDP go down. What does that mean for the average Joe? Jobs, no jobs. The problem is that <clears throat> is that the, that most jobs come from small business and new business startup. Let's make it simple. All jobs do. They don't come from big business. That people think they do. That's a myth. And the the problem is that small businesses. There's about two million kind of pumping juicy businesses. It's our own. I call it an ecosystem. Our own our own rainforest. It's not doing well. Their confidence is way down. When it's down, there aren't there aren't new jobs. That's bad. The other one is that when new businesses start, new business startups as compared to failures is the worst it's been in 30 years. And so that's why we don't have new jobs. Is underemployment just a fact of life in this, what's been called a jobless recovery? It can get pretty serious though. If I'm an engineer out of work, you know, and remember, if I come over and mow your yard, I work for an at one hour or more, and you pay me $20 or more, according to the Department of Labor, I'm not I'm not unemployed, but after I've been in that condition for about eight, un, under grossly underemployed for 18 months, I get I get pretty. It's a pretty desperate situation for me. Gallup um, meticulously interviews those people every month on that, and you're four times more likely to have clinical depression if you've been out of work or grossly underemployed for 18 months or more. So it's, it's very serious. Can these hard times can it make more entrepreneurs in this country? No, I don't. Uh, the reason I say that is it should, and we can. Let me be real clear. But it won't unless leadership makes the development of entrepreneurs as intentional as we have masterfully done over the last 200 years intellectual development. Entrepreneurship has been left to chance, and that, that's, a, that's a pretty deadly game for Americans to be playing right now. The, the real, I'll give you one, one little thing. Businesses used to have been starting over the last 12 years at about 500,000. That's real entrepreneurial activity. The ultimate activity to start a business. 400,000 die. So the net is 100,000. That works pretty well. Those two didn't meet, they crossed about four years ago. So now we have 400,000 starting and 500,000 dying. So entrepreneurship's not doing well. Now, I've heard you be a little bit critical about our, our focus on innovation and say it probably should be more focused on the entrepreneur. If I come across as critical, I don't mean to be bad. Uh, we, we're giving it the wrong expectation. We think if I invent something, jobs come, and that's mistaken. 
That's why we keep putting billions and billions and billions and billions into innovation, because we are so we so desperately need jobs and we so desperately need GDP growth, and billions and billions, not, neither one of them is coming out of it. So, so we need innovation. I think we have a gross, gross, gross oversupply of innovation, and a gross undersupply of business models and people that turn them into customers and then into jobs. What is the role that the federal government, the state government, and the local government play in all this? I, I think they should play. The more limited role they play, the better. And I don't just mean that as a free enterpriser and as a capitalist. They're not really supposed to be in this business. It, it should be local business leaders that make this happen. I don't think we should look to Washington for help. Washington's main job is, secu is security and uh, elections and all the, all the obvious things that we learned in, in, in general politics. But <clears throat> and same, th same thing with local government, you know, police and fire and all that, God, God bless them all. But I think we get in trouble, I'm a businessman, but if I look at Washington, or I, l I live in Washington, D.C., the government there, I'm from Nebraska, if I look at the government there and say, where are the jobs? I think the citizens are looking in the wrong place. It really bothers me, too, because we better not be voting for people that we think are going to get us jobs, because it just doesn't work. How do you feel about the American workforce? It gets criticized a lot, that it's underskilled and that we need to have a more skilled workforce. Well, uh, yeah, but you got to begin with this. That is that it is the very best workforce in the world. Pound for pound, we're the best in the world. This workforce is more innovative. We're better at winning customers. We've been better at um, exporting, and so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty high on that. The place that we're missing is we're missing find early identification of rare talented entrepreneurs, people like Steve Jobs and all that. We've got to make that intentional rather than random. You know, we've long thought of upper mobility, the American dream, something that we have just here in the U.S. But is it also not becoming a global phenomenon of just where? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the divide. Yeah, the, the, the divide is worldwide. But it's so important. You know, America is, is such a mosaic of different sub-tribes sub and sub and sub-societies. So you have a huge divide. Well, in New York City, for, for instance. But if you get to these other towns, Austin or Nashville, you know, where their GDPs are booming and, and new companies are starting, it's like you're on a different planet if you're in Nashville or Austin. I mean, now, if you go to Memphis or Detroit, God bless them both. I mean, the divides are just, I mean, spectacular and, and profound. We got a lot of new stuff coming in, too. People say, well, when will manufacturing be back? Okay, let's give a good, clear answer, never. But what could fix it is you got, you got fracking, which, and cracking follows the factories around it and all that kind of stuff that, that make the uh, derivatives of, of that kind of oil and that sort of thing. You've got nanotechnology coming in, never-ending drones, and you know the mini robot thing is still taking off. We'll get at least the first generation of those. I think there's no limits to what we can do with the middle class and in jobs that are less intellectually uh, cognitive demanding, I think is what they call them. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm. I'm very optimistic about that, but to think jobs are coming back is, uh, I think that's, that's far-fetched. So can we expect a new type of middle-class job? It may not be something that can be put somewhere else offshore, but a new type of highly skilled, certificate type of job. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Workers' relationship with universities are going to change. I mean, it's a lot to think about that, you know, Michael Dell, Larry Ellison, Steve Jobs, and, and um, the Facebook guy and Zuckerberg and yeah, all of those guys. They, none of them went to college. You know, if they did go to college, it was just for a minute. But um, all technically astute. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> but an awful lot of these jobs from you know fracking and everything else, they're going to have a technology base. But how well you can use the internet or the thing we all have in our pocket, that's your university right there. But you wonder about if you and I are both sitting at a table and, and I'm better educated. So, so I don't know, I went to, let's say I went to MIT and, and you went to, I don't want to pick on anybody, but West, West Nebraska State. Okay. It'd be a better question in the near future. Don't judge them on their pedigree. Get a Get a computer out and see which one of them can go deeper into it. Okay. And so, but, but that could be a big equalizer for us. Yeah, well, and I know even major corporations like Boeing are looking more at skills than they are on, on degrees. Let's move on now to exports. We're 5% of the world's population. Just the simple <coughs> laws of supply and demand tells us that there's some opportunity out there. So what should we be doing in this country knowing that we're 5% of the population, 95% of the consumers are out abroad. You know, one of the things we got to do is we've got to say, who are our best friends in the 
world. And, and our two best friends, this is, this is the answer, Canada and Mexico. You got a third? Nope. Those are our two best friends, and nobody else is close. And that's because we export. Our biggest export customer is Canada, over 300 billion. Mexico is 200 billion. And then if you take all of China, hell, it's not even 100 billion. Mexico is way, way, way more valuable. But we export more to Mexico than we do to West Europe. All those, five, you know, the five big states, that's only about 150 billion. But, but, but to export, I think that we need to consider, some, some people call it convergence, but we have so much in common with the Americas. You know, there's a whole bunch of us that are all Americans up and down there. There's unlimited amount of things that we can do together there with, uh, with, with exports. But then the second thing I would do is I'd rekindle our friendship with where all of us came from. Which, not all of us, but so many of us came from, which is, which is West Europe. But, there's un, but see, then you get controlling interest of the world again with economics between those. I, don't, I sound like I'm paranoid about who's going to control the world, but you get the point. Final question. You talked about civic leaders, business leaders, and students while you were in the state. What was your mes main message to them? With students, my, my main message was that it's a very difficult time in the market, but there's a way to position yourself that makes a lot of difference. But it begins with knowing your strengths. you got to get your strengths together and position yourself around your strengths. All the development that you do, develop your strengths. Weakness is never correct. Very few people know that. Strengths develop infinitely. Make that your make that your development plan. When you go into businesses, let the business know that you love free enterprise. Don't hedge and say, well, I'm not sure about profitability or something like that. Demonstrate that you know customers, that you've had customers, that you've won customers, because companies need that. If you're going to specialize in one, this is the time to play on the offensive side of the ball, not the defensive side of the ball, mm -hmm. because everybody, everybody needs customers. The other message was that for America to come back, we've got to make the development of entrepreneurs systematic, and we got to get we got to get better at exporting, or it won't work. Jim Clifton, thank you for your insights. Okay, thank you for your interest. Now, if you'd like to learn more from Mr. Clifton, we have linked to his chairman's blog, where he discusses what really motivates today's workers. Just head to OKRising.com and look under our blog section. Want to share something you've seen here today? Well, all of our episodes are streaming on our YouTube channel at Oklahoma Horizon TV. Or you can subscribe to our weekly free podcast on iTunes. Well, not all jobs are for everyone, but for the right person, the right job isn't work at all. Andy Barth introduces us to an Oklahoman who's made a bare bones career choice. From the outside, it's a typical museum. But once inside, a preserved animal kingdom awaits. From the dangerous T-Rex to the family of apes, this museum shows all creatures, small and large. I have a museum of bones because I started collecting bones and skulls whenever I was a little boy. Jay Villamoretti is the founder and owner of the Museum of Osteology, a museum home to more than 300 skeletons. I took my hobby and started selling skulls. As my collection grew, so did my business, and eventually my collection grew to the point that I wanted to do something with it more than just hoarded it at the house. I wanted to share it with the world. And Villa Moretti says putting together a skeleton is a lot harder than you would think. An enormous amount of work goes into assembling a skeleton. When the public walks by a skeleton, I'll watch them, and they'll just meander past the skeleton, not realizing what went into that. The process for cleaning a skeleton is extensive. The museum receives an animal carcass and begins cutting as much meat off as possible. Then the specimen moves to the bug room, where thousands of beetles strip the remaining flesh to the bone. Once the beetles are through feasting, the crew whitens and degreases the bones before assembling the skeleton. And the bigger the skeleton, the longer it takes. Our humpback whale, once we took possession of it, it took us approximately two years just to clean the skeleton. Once we started to assemble the bones, it was 28 days to put the skeleton together. That was with full, two full-time technicians plus the assistance of three others. And Villa Moretti says he wants to educate those who visit the museum. 
it's a real good feeling when I have a grandmother will come up to me and thank me for doing this and especially thank me for having it in Oklahoma City because she had no idea how wonderful this museum could be. So if you're ever in Oklahoma City and looking for something to do, head to Villa Moretti's place where the displays are just dying to see you. And open seven days a week, the Museum of Osteology is the only all-skeleton museum in the entire world. And we do have a link to their website under this week's stories. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we'll take you on a tour of Oklahoma's burgeoning wine industry. Most people don't know that there's wineries in the state, and so we wanted to, number one, get that awareness out there, and so we were hoping that the wine trail would do that. Plus, we'll look at the prospects for farmers in a drier climate on Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, that is going to wrap us up for today, but you can see more of any of our stories on our website at okhorizon.com. You can watch us on the go with our weekly podcast on iTunes. Follow us throughout the week on Twitter at OK Horizon TV, or just become a Horizon fan on Facebook. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you back here next time.